I want to welcome you today to part four and five of the session Systematic Theology 2. Uh, today we'll be dealing with the doctrine of the church, or ecclesiology, and session four as we begin. Again, I remind you that you're welcome to use the PowerPoint uh, for your ministry or teaching that yours to use however you see fit, and we trust the Lord will bless you as you do. Matthew 16, 13, and 15, Simon Peter answering, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to Peter, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, son of John, because flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock, this confession, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, not hell, will, will not overpower or overcome it. What is the church? The Greek word ekklesia means two-part word, ek, which means out of, and the second part, we get the word kalo, or kalio, which means to call, it means to call out, ekklesia. Then Moses spoke in the beginning, or in the hearing of all the assembly of Israel, the words of this song until they were complete, Deuteronomy 31.30. I will tell you of your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. Psalm 22, verse 22. Bless God in the congregations, even the Lord, you who are of the, fount the fountain of Israel, Psalm 68 and 26. A local congregation, Paul called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Sothenes, our brother, to the church, the assembly of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified, set apart, or called out in Christ Jesus, saints by calling them with all who are in every place who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord our and ours, Paul's declaration, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. The universal church, and he put all things in subjection under his feet, and gave him, Christ, as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all, Ephesians 1, 23. We have a group of local congregations. Acts 9, 31 tells us how the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed unity of the peace. The Jerusalem church was of a size that made it obvious that it met as a number of congregations, yet it is, it is described in the Bible as a single church. The universal church, there is only one church, one body, and one spirit, just as also you were called into one hope of your calling, Ephesians 4.4. 4. Jesus Christ is the head of the church, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ Jesus also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body, Ephesians 5.23. And then later Paul writes, he is also head of the body, the church, Colossians 1 and 18. The church is holy, meaning set apart. The Greek word is hagios. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you? Verse 17. If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Every believer is a priest of God. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2 and 5. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellences, the excellencies of him who has, there's that word, called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, 1 Peter 2.9. The mandate of the church is to make disciples. Go therefore and make disciples of all in the nations. 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Matthew 16, 13 and 19, there is a great need today to understand the essential nature of the church of Jesus Christ from the scriptures as it teaches us. Today we're watching a metamorphosis taking place inside the church at large. Some call it a movement of positive alternatives of doing church. Others see it just as a mere fad or a trend. What we do see, we see churches moving away from the biblical emphasis to anecdotal storytelling and experimentation with quote unquote new methods invented by the minds of men injecting in, and introducing worldly ideas for church practices. Pragmatism is being practiced in the place of sound biblical teaching accompanied by faith or if it works it must be accepted. If many people are coming it must be the truth. Some well-known names have endorsed this and become party of this new paradigm. Leaders have risen that have the intent of changing, reinventing the way we do church. This whole movement has become much bigger than Rick Warren and his, quote, purpose-driven church. It now has a life of its own. At best, it is a sordid mixture of a few biblical principles and philosophies of men blended and sprinkled together with business worldly practices. At worst, it's a removal, or better yet, a wholesale betrayal from the very fabric or foundations that Jesus Christ promised to build and to what the apostle gave for the church to stand upon. In Isaiah 31 says, Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, who takes counsel, but not of me, and who devises plans, but not of my spirit that they may add sin to sin. So what we find today is that the gospel of Christ itself is being compromised. It's being softened to appeal to what they call as a spiritual consumers in order to the purpose is to enlarge the church's borders. Having forsaken the plan and pattern given by the chief architect, its foundation as established on the day of Pentecost. These carnal attempts to implement successful business practices into the church to help the church grow seems pathetic to the one who is before all things and in him all things consist. To the one who holds all things together by the word of his power, who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, Revelation 2 and 1. Many have stopped discerning what is now emerging right before our eyes, or they have bought into this scheme of themselves for the sake of being, quote, unquote, relevant. They have forgotten to employ common sense, much less biblical sense, to understand what is taking place today. And frankly, for the last, in the last time that I looked and checked the scriptures, the church is not broken. It wasn't broken. It is we who are broken. Therefore we must begin and end with the Word of God as the foundation in order to comprehend what the church is and from such endeavor we can then begin to grasp its purpose, its mission, and its message. A radical mission, a radical message is presented in the scriptures. It was radical then and it is just as radical today. The word in the Greek ecclesia is used approximately 114 times in referring to the church of the assembly. It is a compound word, as I mentioned earlier, two parts of the Greek, the preposition ek, which means to, to out of and called out. It means a calling out and so a gathering, an assembly of people who've been called out from their homes into some public place. There's Greek lexicon. People change. The weather changes. For God never changes. His divine attributes, his immutability, he's immutable. He's forever the same, forever God. He was, he is, and always will be. God is just as holy, just as righteous, 
just as merciful today as he was yesterday. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. America's changing politically, culturally, and morally. The Oxford Dictionary just recently announced that it's changing, changing the definition of marriage. No longer is it a union between one man and one woman. The church may have decided that we, in order to survive, we need to change the way we do church. Many have already determined that we need to re-engineer the church, reinvent the church, that we need to make people to feel better about themselves, feel good, to entertain them with some Hollywood performances, lights, whistles, and bells. The pulpits today are flooded with hired, trained professionals with their easy believism struggling with what type of music, can you imagine, to use for worship. A recent Barna poll, 77% of those were polled, 2015, believed that there are no absolutes, no right or wrong. Pluralism means many ways, many religions, many beliefs, and all are on the same journey, heading in the same direction. You have your bus, and we have our bus. You have your Bible, I have my Bible. Pragmatism, that's the belief that if it works, it must be right, the truth, if crowds are coming, then it must be the truth. Joel Osteen, today the average ministry lasts around 18 to 24 months. Approximately 4,000 churches closed their doors in 2015. You see, the spiritual condition or the state of the church is an absolute desperate. The church is slowly and methodically drifting from its moorings moving away from its core foundation. Today, when personal experiences and traditions now seem to trump the truth, with its man-made creeds and doctrines of men, nothing more than a mere form of ritualism and cold theology prevails. In Amos 5, 21 and 23, the prophet says, I hate, I reject your festivals, nor do I delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer up to me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. And I will not even look at the peace offerings of your fatlings, taken away from me the noise of your songs. I will not even listen to the sounds of your harps. Learn this. Judaism, with its innumerable observances, its elaborate rituals, its frequent and costly sacrifices, Still nowhere is there to be found more disclaimers, more denunciations of a merely hollow ritual and ceremonial piety than what is revealed in the scriptures of the Old Testament. This is but one of the many declarations that the true and living God will not accept any tribute of the hands of men which may be offered in lieu of the homage of the heart the outward manifestations of religion which God rejects. And you'll notice it says, number one, sacred assemblies are displeasing to the Lord. Number two, God despises the gatherings of his people. More remarkable still is the sacred songs and strains of music are as a discord to his ears. The very psalms in which the divine attributes are celebrated and the divine gifts acknowledged are no longer acceptable to God, who once inhabited the praises of Israel. The very grounds upon which God rejects the outward manifestations of religion is not because they are themselves an inappropriate tribute of worship and consecration, but because they are not expressive of sincere worship, of gratitude, confidence, of love from a broken and contrite heart. This people, saith the searcher of the hearts, they draw near unto me with their mouths, their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And because ceremonial observances may be, and in the cases in question here, are consistent with an idolatrous, idolatrous and wicked life, the very men who were punctitious, or extremely attentive, strict or exact in their observance of the formalities, conduct or actions, in these ceremonies and sacrifices, men were tampering 
with the idolatry of surrounding peoples and therefore were acting with injustice and selfishness in the ordinary and daily relationships of life. And because of these human manifestations, as they are as a matter of fact, substituted for those feelings and purposes for which they are intended to promote. In fact, seeming religiously or righteously, or what we would call seeming religious religiousness simply hides the absence of real worship. To the real possibility, so much that such absence is often covered or camouflaged, goes unnoticed by the apparent but heartless and formal worshiper. In Matthew 16, 13, and 19, the Septuagint uses the word ecclesia from the Hebrew word where we get the word koha, a congregation assembly, a company of organized body of people. It refers to meetings or civil affairs, 1 Kings 2 and 3, for war, Numbers 22 and 4, for nations, Genesis 35, 11, and a variety of other gatherings, including, and most importantly, Israel's gatherings for religious pur purposes, Deuteronomy 9 and 10, uh, Joel chapter, chapter 2 and 16. Ecclesiology asks the question, who is the church? Is it a visible or earthly entity? Uh, is it a church in the sense of a specific denomination or institution? Is it simply a spiritual entity? Or is it the body of all believing professing Christians everywhere, regardless of their denominational differences and disunity? What is the relationship between living Christians and departed Christians, the cloud of witnesses? Do they, those on earth and those in heaven, constitute together the church? Or must one join a church? What is the role of corporate worship? Is it in fact necessary? Can salvation be found outside of a formal membership? What constitutes membership? Is it baptism? Is it a formal acceptance of a creed or regular participation? What is the authority of the church? What does the church do? What are the sacraments or the divine ordinance and the liturgies in the context of the church? Are they part of the church's mission to preach the gospel? What role does the Great Commission have regarding the church? How should the church be governed? What are the proper methods of choosing, or we would use the word, ordaining or electing the elders, the under shepherds of the flock, elders, servants, deacons, preachers, evangelists? What is their role, their function within the context of the church? Is an ordained clergy necessary? So you see, from this little short list of questions raised as being just a few of the core issues of the life, the structure, and the mission of the church, the aim of our short time together today is not going to allow us to answer all of those questions. One, to show the uniqueness of the Bible as being the only standard, the final arbitrator which God has given. Number two. Therefore, as being the final and only standard as to all matters of faith and practice, as to the pattern of God's plan for building his church, Hebrews 8, 5, be sure that you make all things according to the pattern shown you. The scripture's primary purpose is to reveal God and not man. The primary focus of worship is toward God and not to man. The church is the Lord's. He builds the church. He has given to us the blueprints and the pattern that we are to follow. What if we corrupt, pollute, or change, or modify the Lord's original plan, his divine pattern for his church? What then would be the consequences of such corruption? The focus then is no longer about Jesus Christ, for it soon mutates into being all about man especially with today's pop culture, with its overt attempt to overthrow the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, many a preacher has taken the bait and swallowed it, hook, line, and sinker. Whenever the church seeks to promote self about what makes us feel good, look good, what is popular, what is politically correct, 
the church soon becomes pragmatic in the construct that more is better and truth therefore then falls victim to the masses and the end result is a humanistic religion that elevates man to the sinner and dethrones the Lord Jesus Christ. So this leads us to two very important dimensions that the Bible reveals about Christ and his church. First, Christ established his church. Upon this rock, Peter's confession, that he believed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, that Jesus Christ being the Son of the living God, that is the foundation of the rock of that confession. His primary mission, to seek and to save sinners, Luke 19.10. The Great Commission, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teaching them all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Number three, visible, in that there are local expressions of the church which Christians can active, actively commit themselves to. Just because a person goes to church does not mean they are, in fact, part of the spiritual body of Christ. What evidence do we have that best describes this blatant abandonment of Scripture, witnessed by visible evidence? One, the church has forsaken the standard. The result being the church becomes nothing more than that social construct. It's all about our gatherings. It's all about what we do for the community. It's about uh, having a special function or whatever. We've lost our mission because we've lost the message and the messenger and many therefore have concluded that therefore the church needs to change to adjust so let's sugarcoat the sermonettes let's tickle their ears oh and we don't use the H word here what is the H word it's this discovery that I made one day while traveling in Evansville Indiana to visit a family member who was in the hospital at the Deaconess Hospital in downtown Evansville, Indiana. As I was driving to that hospital that day, about a block away to the main entrance of the hospital, there's this large complex, three, two, three blocks long, of one particular church that engulfed those whole three blocks. Massive buildings. And I looked on the marquee as I was driving by, and it says, everybody welcome, worship at 9.30 and at 11. And come, everybody's welcome. We don't use the H word here. Well, I was fascinated. So when I came out of the hospital visit, I wrote down the phone number. I called the church. I get this secretary, and she's on the phone. And I said, ma'am, could you help me? I noticed on the, on the marquee of your church sign, it says, uh, everybody's welcome that you don't use the H word here. And I'm just fascinated. What do you mean by the H word? So, well, I... I think that probably be some the pastor of the church needs to help you with that. I said, well, is he in? He said, no, he's out somewhere. Uh, I think he was playing golf or something anyway. I said, well, let me leave a message. So I gave him my number my name. I waited two or three days. Then here I called her back. I haven't heard from him. And she said, well, he's uh, out somewhere doing something else. I said, well, is there anybody that can help me? She said, well, hey, hold on. I think one of the associate pastors are here. He gets on the line, and I said, excuse me, sir, I noticed your sign said, welcome everybody, 9.30 and 11, to worship. We don't use the H word. Can you tell me what that is? He said, oh, yeah, we don't use the word hell here. I said, you don't use the word hell at the church? Oh, no, 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 we don't do that. I said, sir, were you aware that Jesus preached more about hell than he did heaven? Of the 23 times in the scriptures, he speaks about the word Gehenna, the hellfire, everlasting punishment. It wasn't long that I heard that little click of the receiver and the buzzing or the bzzz. Imagine that. We don't use the H word here. The church came by divine revelation. The Lord asked, whom do men say that I am? Peter identified who he was. You are the Christ, the Messiah. The church was initiated by Christ in response to his declaration upon this confession, Peter. Jesus said he would build his church. The church was seen as a future event. The Lord said, I will build my church, future tense. 
that was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost when Peter, standing with the eleven, preached the first gospel sermon ever recorded in Scripture. Under the influence of the Holy Spirit, he preaches of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, that they had been guilty of crucifying the Son of God, they cried out and said, Men and brethren, what must we do? And Peter answers their cry. The church belongs to Christ upon this confession. I'll build my church. The gates of Hades will not prevail against it. The church, again, called out ones, meaning to call out people. The twofold meaning, called out from the world and their previous lifestyle. It's called the put off and the put on. Called together for a purpose, Acts 2.42, to worship, to carry out the great commission, to the breaking of bread and the teachings of the doctrines of Scripture. What is the church? What the church means to different people? Some look at it as a structure, Catholicism, a physical cathedral, a building, a person feels the presence of God. Then they didn't feel this experience outside the church, but it's in the church building we experience God. Some look at it as a benevolent side. It's purpose to feed, to clothe the hungry and, the, and those who need help, the poor, the orphan, the widow, the afflicted, James 1.27. Some look at it as a social construct, united socially, or a political organization, Acts 19.32 and 39. What the church means to different people. Some look at it as a money-raising organization. Boy, the TV evangelists are having a heyday today. Uh, Benny Hinn, my gracious sakes, Benny. The FBI has just raided your, uh, your, your complex, and the Internal Revenue Service has taken computer after computer. The church is of a human origin, some look at. It's the result of, many times, a religious division. John 17, 21, Jesus prayed for the unity of the church of the oneness. So the word is used two separate sentences, two sentences in the word universal. It's Matthew 16 and 18. It consists of both the living and the dead since the cross of Christ. In a local sense, the church locally consists of those believers in a single geographical location who regularly come together, assemble together to worship and do the work that God called the church to do. It, a, re, a region of local churches, also the churches of Galatia, 1 Corinthians 16 and 1, 2 Corinthians 8 1. Also, we see it as a local church, a congregation or assembly, the, the church at uh, St. Crea, Romans 16 1. Uh, and then the churches of Christ, the churches of the church of God, or the church. The importance of the church, people have become disenchanted. Why? Well, I can say, well, one, the junkyard religion, the easy believism today, like someone who had only seen a broken and damaged car all their life, that's all they've ever known before. He had never seen a new car or the real thing, has abandoned its primary purpose, its mission and message. Preachers who are attempting to reinvent, re-engineer the church. What if all the churches that people ever really see are the ones that are fractured and broken, dysfunctional, weird and unbiblical? Who could blame them for being turned off? by this man-made invention of men. Hypocrisy or spiritual versus carnal because of some personal or unpleasant past experience. Maybe someone had been injured or had been hurt by someone within the church, a minister, present or past. God planned the church from the creation of the world. Ephesians chapter 3, 11 and 21. God united both Jew and Gentile through the church. Ephesians 2, 13 and 19. We must be in the church or the body in Christ, to be in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3.27. All spiritual blessings are in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 1.3. Sins are forgiven. Redemption is only in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 1.7. We become a new creature in Christ Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Salvation in Jesus Christ alone, for no other name given among men, whereby we must be saved. All spiritual blessings are in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 1.3. We are all baptized into the one body by the agency of the, the Greek term here used, by the agency, or mean the word is used causal, 
by the by the one spirit, the causal agent of by the spirit of God of doing the acting. The one doing the action is the Holy Spirit. The one receiving is the recipient. The Holy Spirit does the work. The believer does the listening and responding. The local church commanded to assemble together on the first day of the week, Acts 2, 42 and 46, 1 Corinthians 11, 18. To the giving of the treasury, to the common treasury, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. For the purpose of partaking of the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 11, 33, Acts 20 and 7. To assemble to worship for the edification of the body of Christ. To the teaching and encouragement, 1 Corinthians 14 and 26. The design and pattern of the tabernacle is a picture or a type, and the church being the antitype. There is a specific pattern or blueprint of doctrine and worship. Listen to Hebrews 8, 4, and 5. Be sure to make all things according to the pattern or blueprint that was shown to you. Romans 6, 17, the form of doctrine, form in the Greek means a cast into which molten material is poured so as to make its shape. W.H. Vaughn. However, today men are creating their own cast instead of using God's divine blueprint cast already given. The standard or the form by reinventing the church, and that would be a great time for you to bring up a type of discussion. How does this happen? Titus chapter 2, verse 1, 2 Timothy 1, 13. Notice what Paul says. Speak words fitting for sound doctrine. The church is a collection or the gathering of the assembly of God's set-apart people. And it certainly is not a physical building, but a living, breathing entity of people. The Ark of Noah and the church that Christ built are in comparison. One, the Ark was in the Old Testament. The antitype of the New Testament is the church. The body of Christ being the image is the most used analogy of the church. Christ is presented as the head of the church, as the body. The members are to grow up in all aspects, Ephesians 4.15. The spiritual lesson here is what? Unity. Christians apart are part of the same body and part of one another, Romans 12.5. The body describes how important it is to be together in unity. This is a word picture that represents the church as a place or the dwelling place, or the presence of God. The people exalt Christ as his indwelling presence is witnessed in the life and the walk of each Christian. This temple grows as we add new converts, exercise spiritual maturity, being doers of the word and not hearers only. A temple can be weak or it can be strong. It can be immature or it can be mature. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15. It's called the Bride of Christ, Revelation 2.19, 2 Corinthians 11.2. The major teaching demonstrates Christ's limitless, unchanging relationship of his love and watch care for his bride, the church. Christ loves us in spite of ourselves, not because what we do or how well we do it. A marriage involves intimacy, so the heavenly picture reflects an active, intimate relationship between Christ and his church, his people. The flock of God, Acts 20 and 28. Peter used this picture when he instructs the elders under the, being the under shepherds to do what? Feed the flock. Jesus used the same expression to illustrate the relationship between himself and his followers as being the good shepherd. The shepherd knows his sheep by name, and they, the sheep, hear his voice. They become one flock with one shepherd, and they follow him. Then we have the analogy of the vine and branches, the garden of God. It's a collective phrase of several words. One, vine, there's a planting. Two, three, there's a harvest. And four, there's an abidingness. A garden is cultivated, or a plot of ground, where weeds are continually removed and seeds are sown. The importance of the abiding, there is pruning. For without pruning, we bear no fruit. Apart from Jesus Christ, John 15, we can do nothing. The purpose of the garden is to bear fruit, a harvest, as visible evidence. After referring to his father, 
as being the vine dresser, Christ explains that the Father prunes the branches. What, are, what about the consequences of pruning and the cutting and the burning of fruitless branches? Does it mean that one can lose their salvation? Here again, an opportunity to stop, do some detailed discussion and teaching on this matter. The family of God. This term also incorporates other terms such as saints or sanctified ones, the elect, the members of the body. The purpose of this picture is to show identity. This is relational identity that allows us to call God our Father. In the New Testament, all believers are priests, and they need but one to mediate for them, 1 Peter 2.9. As priests, we perform three functions. Sacrifices. We present our bodies as living sacrifices, Romans 12, 1 and 2. As witnesses, whenever we share the gospel, Romans 1, 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for in the gospel is the power of God and the salvation. And then there's intercession, when we pray for each other and for the lost. The church is an assembly of professing believers. Truth. Not all who make a confession or a profession of faith actually possess eternal life. The presence of Christ dwells in the church. The church is under the discipline of God's word. The mission of the church is to carry out the Great Commission. The church administers the ordinances, baptism, and the Lord's Supper. The church began on the day of Pentecost, that view that's held by most believers, presented by Schaefer in his writings on systematic theology. Schaefer gives four prerequisites for beginning of the church. One, there must first be a death, the death of the testator, Jesus Christ, at the cross. There must be a, re a resurrection, those who are raised up. There must be an ascension, and there must be the advent, or the presence of the Holy Spirit. There are three basic expressions of church authority. Episcopal, that's bishop or elders, as primary leaders to oversee the church, the shepherds. Representative form, a committee of people, board, or denominational hierarchy, governing over all. There's congregational, where ultimate authority in all things, as a matter of faith and practice, rests and resides in the local church as being autonomous. All three forms appeal to Scripture. Then the question then remains for us is to talk about which one do you practice? Denomination, the word does not come from the Bible, never not taught. That's a group of churches with a similar doctrinal beliefs, similar traditions and backgrounds, who share the same goals in ministry, and have bound themselves together to establish, quote, a fellowship of churches. Today, there are approximately 250 denominations just in the United States alone. 